join the governor and Amy and Heath in this effort. You know, um, Heath alluded to this, we have 178 school districts in this state. And when you add private schools, that means we've got dozens of different approaches that we've learned from from the last semester. And I'm thrilled that this will be an effort to put some of those important findings together, combining the data and information that's emerging from public health with some of the new and promising practices we're seeing in K-12 to figure out how do we get as many students and teachers back as safely as we can in the second semester and, and potentially learning things we'll need to use into the next school year as well. You know, this includes um, everything from a particular focus on our youngest learners who we know really struggle and, and aren't developmentally in a, an appropriate age range for ongoing online learning all the way up to middle school and high school where we know students are struggling with school attachment and social emotional gaps as well from, from isolation as well as some really important work I mean, we'll be able to do to look at particular populations of kids, special education learners and English language learners, as well as students who've experienced um, you know, ongoing and unusual amounts of transience or disruption in their learning because of the economic impacts as well. So thrilled to lend CEI's support to this and work with this group. Thank you, and I, I think Amy Bach is having um, some technical difficulties entering presenter mode. She might be with us shortly as a presenter. Uh, and, and she will uh, say a few words. Uh, but in the meantime, why don't we open it up for questions? And then uh, when Amy is able to successfully enter uh, presentation mode, um, we welcome her to say a few words. Uh, do I have a staff person who can instruct uh, press on how to ask questions? Katie Eastman, go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, Katie with Nine News. Um, Governor Polis, I wanted to ask, uh, you said schools are a relatively safe place. What do you mean by that? How does that line up with the outbreak numbers we're seeing? And, and while we know kids might be at a lower risk, they can still take the virus home to people who are more vulnerable. So yeah. how do you talk about that? Well, look, every, every, uh, during a pandemic, every, every action we take entails some risk. Uh, we, we go buy groceries, we um, uh, go buy clothing at a store, um, your job that people work at, um, right? You might work near others. Um, so it's really a question of how can, can people make the, be empowered to make the right choices to minimize their risks. And for many families, uh, a, safe public school environment in the classroom or, or private school if they go there is one of the safest places their kids can can be uh, it can also be a very safe place for educators um, in terms of being able to work in an environment where both the students and the teachers have masks where there are strong protocols around how uh, the cohorts are run to prevent outbreaks so uh, we really need to thread this needle as a society we value education it's our future. It's your kid's future. Every family in Colorado cares about the success of their kids. And we just have to figure out how to make sure that schools can be as safe as they can for in classroom education during a pandemic. Now, does that mean that for some families, particularly maybe a kid being raised by their grandparents in their 70s who are very high risk for the virus and are retired, they might support online education and might not want any exposure and they might not be going to the grocery store, they might be ordering delivery, they might be staying in when the risk is high and they might want their, their grandchild to stay in. That's an individual decision people make. But for many families, I dare say most families, uh, schools are often one of the safest places that kids can be during the day. Let me turn it over to Keith, who's done, uh, who talks a lot about the public health benefit of schools as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with those comments. I mean, we all have had an opportunity to learn sort of how to um, uh, to implement protocols um, that are going to be successful. Uh, and so our, our schools, they, they do, they offer layers of these prevention protocols. Um, it's not only one um, prevention method, but it's actually a series of those prevention methods. And where we see schools that are implementing those um, those layers and actually have strict, strict adherence um, to those layers, um, those the, the, the benefits are there. We do see those um, school environments being um, very safe. You know, there are a number of other environments um, outside of the schools um, that actually are not nearly as safe where they don't have um, the same either adherence to the protocols um, or they don't have any oversight um, over those protocols. So I think one thing I would want to just acknowledge is that um, no matter what school district um, you're working from, our teachers and our staff 
um, and our leadership in school districts have done a tremendous job thinking about what are all the precautionary measures um, that we know are important for COVID, how do we implement them into a school environment, and how do we do this successfully? Um, and so we'll continue to learn in terms of what some of those best practices are, where some schools are, um, are really demonstrating um, maybe uh, improvements and how we can share some of those lessons across the many different school districts. Um, but I think realistically, our data, at least in Eagle County, um, would suggest that um, is very true. Our school environment is actually a safer environment than many of the other environments in our community where there are no protocols being implemented um, and or there are no, there's no enforcement of those protocols. Hi, uh, this is Melanie Asmar with Chalkbeat. Um, one of the main barriers that's being cited by districts uh, has been the, the quarantine um, rules. And I know CDPHE just put out new guidelines today. Um, I'm wondering if you can address, um, you know, what exactly is, is new in those guidelines and, and you know, why um, uh, it seems they're, they're sort of a loosening and, and why is that safe at this time? Governor, you're on mute still. <clears throat> oh, they, they had to unmute me. Uh, on the specifics, uh, we will have a, a follow-up conversation with uh, somebody from CDPHE. We're happy to have either Dr. Herlihy or uh, Jill Ryan um, answer specifics. I'll just say uh, at a high level, uh, we got a lot of input from, uh, from county health officials, from doctors, uh, from our state uh, science uh, TIS, uh, as well as the input from school districts and teachers and uh, really feel confident that these protocols, which are nearly identical to the protocols that worked in well in, in August and September, are a, a good way to maximize in-person instruction and keep staff and students safe. On, on the specifics of them, we'll, have, we'll link you up on a subsequent conversation with one of our health officials. Hello, Governor. Jesús Carrasquel from Noticias Univision Colorado. Sí. Gobernador, algunos estudios revelan que los niños pueden ser asintomáticos o portadores del virus. ¿Cómo cree usted que el equipo que formó para reabrir las escuelas garanticen que esto no se propague el virus en las familias de los estudiantes y luego en la comunidad? Um, sí. Um, uh, en mu muchas veces las escuelas son el lugar más seguro para los estudiantes y para uh, las maestras también. <coughs> las escuelas son un, un parte muy importante de la futura. Es importante, es importante preparar los niños para tener ganos en sus futuros. Y por esta razón uh, es una prioridad en nuestra administración para regresar el máximo número de estudiantes a la escuela en una situación más segura que posible. Um, nada en, durante la pandemia es totalmente seguro, pero tenemos la oportunidad en las escuelas para mejorar la seguridad de profesores y también estudiantes. Hi, Governor Marshall Zellinger with Nine News. By now, you know that Denver Mayor Michael Hancock has flown out of DIA today to spend Thanksgiving with his wife and daughter out of the state. <clears throat> you were both at a news conference last week encouraging people to alter their Thanksgiving plans and caution about travel. Two things. One, did he ever tell you he was leaving the state while also making those statements to the public? And second, how can you share the stage with him to impart COVID-19 safety and precautions after his travel now uh so no i've not had any i've not had any conversations with the mayor about his, his thanksgiving plans and and uh was not aware of them uh, our own plans and i'm very close to my extended family we usually have thanksgiving with cousins and my parents and uh you know 15 or 20 people sometimes two thanksgivings because we have a, a fun family uh, this year, we are not doing that. Uh, we are just uh, having the four of us and our little dog, Gia. Uh, I'll be cooking all day tomorrow for the four of us. I have the feeling there'll be a lot of leftovers because we couldn't find a small turkey. Uh, and my partner, Marlon's vegan. So we got a 14 pound turkey. There's only three of us who eat turkey. Well, four, including Gia. She's only 10 pounds, though. And of course, the kids. So uh, I'll be cooking all day tomorrow. 
and uh, look forward to having a uh, small family get together with our four members of our family and our dog, Gia. And that's because we care deeply about our extended family. And I haven't seen my parents in nine months, uh, and that's very hard. Um, and uh, we've only seen Marlon's dad and sister once. Uh, we did a socially distant visit over summer with them and Bertha. Uh, that's very, very hard. But uh, not only do I want to set the example as, as, as governor, of course, but 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 frankly, this is what we do because we love our family. And I, my parents are 76. I want them to be here for 20 more years. My my grand my my late grandmother of blessed memory, June Polis, lived age 96. Um, they have good genes, but uh, good genes don't help when you're 76 um, with the, with coronavirus, which uh, sends one in four 76 year olds to the hospital. Uh, some make it, some don't, and uh, we want to avoid that fate for my parents and my aunts and my uncles. Oh, Amy Baca O'Leary has joined us. Uh, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, Amy. Uh, we said great things about educators and teachers and the the, the initial work of the task force. Do you just want to um, just say a few words about your hopes and and um, you know and and our opportunity to work together for safe uh, in person instruction? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Governor. And yes, um, as the president of the CEA representing 39,000 educators across the state, um, we are thrilled for this opportunity to be a part of this work group um, to discuss the, the real challenges um, ahead and the real opportunities ahead for us to uh, get to a place to safely reopen our schools to in-person learning. Um, of course, education has been happening all across our state and all of our schools in, in, in various ways this fall. We've learned a lot of lessons um, and we have a, a, lot of, um, a lot of that information we can put to use so that we can um, all work collectively and collaboratively to get to that place that we all know where we want to be, um, which is in safe in-person learning. Um, there is nowhere that our educators want to be more than with their students. There is nowhere that our students want to be more. Well, maybe they might want to be playing video games and stuff, but um, we know that learning and socializing is so important um, to our students. And so we are thankful for this opportunity to work together um, so that we can learn from, from this past spring, this summer, and this fall um, so that we can move forward collectively on safely opening our schools um, with as few disruptions um, as possible to in-person learning. So very thankful for this opportunity, Governor, and happy to do this work um, with you all. Thank you, and we'll continue with the questions. And sorry, uh, Amy, for the technical difficulties. I'm glad you're able to resolve them. Um, next question. Hi, uh, this is Taylor Summers for NBC News Radio, and this is for anyone here. Um, even if students can return to in-person learning uninterrupted starting in January, the damage here in a lot of ways to their education has been done over the last nine months. So looking ahead here to a post COVID-19 world, what can be done to reform our education system here and make up for some of these shortfalls that our students are going to be facing over the coming months and even years? First, let me just start a preface by saying that's the, uh, beyond the scope of this working group. Uh, there's a lot of broader discussions with many stakeholders. I want Rebecca to talk about that. She's been leading some of the thought process around that. But just to be clear, uh, this group will really focus in a targeted way in safe return to in-person instruction. Rebecca? Sure. Outside of this working group, CEI started setting that table for conversations about the 21-22 school year and beyond. We're starting to work with some school districts across Colorado who are thinking seriously about breaking that challenge up. Uh, you've got to start thinking a little differently about different grade cohorts. Obviously, K through two, we know that the significant concern is about reading gaps and about math instruction. Students who haven't yet learned to read couldn't tackle that by themselves if they were in a remote environment, and it's really tough to teach reading. Um, to a young child through remote means. And so really starting to think about some best practices that exist already in schools about how they use summer and how they really focus on capturing those reading and math gaps in the early years. As you get into later grade, um, grade spans, folks are thinking creatively about summer and concurrent enrollment, alternative approaches to fifth year programs for students who would have graduated in the class of 2020, 2021, 
Um, and then particularly thinking about school attachment. So students who would have been in sixth grade or ninth grade this year or any of those transition years, um, maybe haven't set foot in their school and haven't had exposure to their peers, haven't met a teacher in person. So I think when we break that up into particular grade bands, we'll start to see really important and impressive solutions arise as we think about the 21-22 school year and the tail of this disruption. Hi, this is Erin Prater with the Colorado Springs and Denver Gazette. I know this question has been brought up before um, yesterday as well, but how do you keep schools open with so many staff um, quarantined? Um, and, and maybe this is addressed today by these new, this new guidance that I've not read, but is there talk of allowing staff who aren't licensed perhaps? What are some of the ideas that are being discussed? And then also why not focus, and maybe you are, on developing online instruction and really beefing that up that could benefit all students regardless of whether you know they're healthy and they have a healthy family or whether they have a medical condition or live with those who do. Thank you. Um, let's see who wants to, to comment on that. Maybe Rebecca, Amy, Heath, Amy, yeah. go ahead. Amy first. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, I'm happy to comment on that. Thank you. Um, I believe this is this is one of the things that this work group is going to tackle, and it's one of the reasons why the governor is, is pulling us together. We need to address those questions and think creatively and be innovative about how we address um, some of those barriers and challenges. The substitute shortage is an extreme challenge that many of our districts are experiencing. And so we need to talk together collectively, collaboratively about how we're addressing that substitute shortage and how we can overcome that staffing um, shortage when, when we have to follow that quarantine guidance. That, that is, um, we're, we're happy to follow the quarantine guidance because it's keeping our students and our staff safe, but we do need to talk about those implementation challenges and how we overcome them. And that to me is one of the great um, opportunities that this work group has is for us to think creatively, to be innovative of how we approach that type of a challenge. I'd say too, on the second part of that question, obviously tackling substitutes and staff capacity is critical. Um, on online learning, we are absolutely seeing leapfrog practices um, and that, that work is getting better and better. The state and CEI are working with at least three or four technical assistance providers who are improving schools approaches to virtual instruction. I would say though, um, as, a, as a trained educator myself, there's just no replacement for most kids on most things to in-person learning. And so I'm glad that's, that's the primary focus of this group. Yeah, maybe I can offer one other thought here. Um, from my perspective, I think the single most important thing that we can do that helps support teachers and some of the staffing capacity issues is as a community, as a state, we need to lower the transmission of COVID in our own respective communities, whether we have kids or not. Um, it doesn't matter. All of our behaviors, all of all of our exposures, what we do actually has a ripple effect um, in our community. So the single most important thing we all can do to actually help support our youth, our teachers, our school districts is actually lowering transmission in the community. Thank you. Next question. Sorry, this is uh, Gabrielle Franklin from Fox 31. Um, have two different questions here, one for the governor and then one for um, our leaders in education. Um, Governor, just to follow up on a question that was asked earlier, are you disappointed in Mayor Hancock's decision to leave the state um, via air travel? And then for our education leaders, when it comes to the updated guidance, is there a certain uh, sense of hope when it comes to looking at um, some of the guidance referring to siblings and just close contact? We know kids like to mingle a lot and, and get together. Is there a certain sense that this will really help bring down the number of outbreaks that we see here in Colorado related to schools. So I've not discussed uh, personal Thanksgiving plans with with the mayor or others. I, I uh, was not aware of his plans. Uh, look, I just want Colorado to make the best informed decision they have with the data they have. We have one in 41 people are currently contagious with coronavirus. That means if you have a Thanksgiving party of 10, there's about a one in four chance that somebody is is could be bringing it into your home. Um, at the very least, of course, there's plenty of Coloradans who've been self-quarantining for two weeks to have those larger get-togethers, and if they have, um, that reduces the risk. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, making sure that nobody has any symptoms whatsoever is absolutely critical. Nobody, nobody with the sniffles or a headache or a fever should even consider going to a family get-together. Uh, and then beyond that, people should know that about 40% of 
people with coronavirus are asymptomatic but contagious. And unfortunately, it's higher for younger groups. So if you're thinking about the nephews, the nieces, teens, and 20s, uh, it's as high as 60% uh, that could be asymptomatic, but it could easily uh, be contagious for grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle. And in, in the types of gatherings that are traditionally associated with Thanksgiving, close physical proximity, no mass around the table, transmission is very likely. So with 10 people, one in four chance somebody brings it in, it's very likely to go from one person to three people or five people uh, in that kind of environment. Um, okay, on the second question, uh, uh, Keith or Rebecca, do you want to talk about those protocols a little bit? And Gabrielle, I don't know if we still have a chance, but would you be able to repeat the second part of that question? Yes, um, I was asking about uh, the guidance when it comes to close contacts. I saw that, you know, the state updated it in that regard and then talking about siblings. I'm just asking, you know, how you guys think that would uh, play a, a big role in reduction when it comes to case transmission. Yeah, I, I think I think it can play um, a pretty significant role. I think the one thing that I would offer up is that if anybody in the household right now is um, is suffering symptoms that might be considered COVID, um, realistically at that point in time, it's really important for the rest of the, um, the household members to start considering sort of what their quarantine measures should be. Um, so realistically within our school environment, what we've seen a few times is where one um, household member has been sick, um, has been scheduled to get testing, and as they're waiting for the test results, um, the kids um, or somebody else may either go into the school environment or a work environment. And so um, within a couple of days, those individuals might turn positive as well. And then we have that exposure potential in school. So I think all, all things start probably sort of within what's a, in, in our own control. So I would just put that out there as something that's really important. I think the quarantine measures that the state um, has uh, recently revised and is implementing is gonna be um, a step in the right direction and really help um, help us out as we're doing the contact tracing and those investigations. It's gonna help with um, the, the staff shortages. It's also gonna help, um, I think what I would offer up is still the most important thing we can do um, to help around the quarantine needs within a school is still lower the transmission within our community so i think the governor spoke very clearly in terms of what that could look like around thanksgiving but realistically we all need to do our part in terms of reducing our activity with others that are not in our household um, and to the degree that we can do that we'll actually cut down these numbers and we'll actually see better supports and um, the quarantine concerns will be at least reduced in our communities Uh, Governor Charles Ashby from the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel. So I can't ask the uh, hand car question again. I guess there's no point in that. But uh, I will ask this, though. Uh, one of you guys mentioned about uh, students wanting to go back to class because they want to they want to get out of the house. And don't we all? Uh, but and I know your focus is on in in person class, but I'm wondering about extracurricular activities such as sporting events and that sort of thing. Are you addressing that at all, or is it just about instruction? There were several remarks uh, in on, on the uh, working group about the importance of extra extracurricular acti activities to keeping students engaged. Um, and so we, we fully appreciate the core academic mission of schools, but I think members of the task force also uh, of the working group feel strongly about how we can safely do extracurricular activities, which are a way to keep students involved in the school experience, and also many of which have a direct nexus to uh, the academic side as well. Um, Rebecca or Heath, do you wanna address that? I was uh, would just echo what the governor said. We were thrilled to, to hear that task force working group members really do wanna focus on that as well. We know that particularly for older students, um, a singularly academic focus, if you're a student who has struggled or hasn't felt attached to school in the past, um may not prevent what we want to prevent which is an increase in dropout and disengagement so i think the working group will look at schools who've really struck the right balance between a combination of in-person learning academically with the other factors that keep students connected to school Hi there, Tini Ricciardi with the Denver Post. Thanks so much for taking our questions. Um, you mentioned that you have dozens of schools to learn from about what they did this semester. I'm curious, what were some of the biggest lessons that you guys learned this fall? Um, what innovations uh, or positive things do you hope processes um, stick around post pandemic? And then also when it comes to predictability, 
how is the state going to empower districts and um, provide that level of clarity, predictability, and transparency about um, when in-person learning is appropriate versus remote learning versus hybrid? Thank you. And, and by the way, this is the uh, the last question. I want to thank you, uh, Tini, as well. There are great examples of of uh, what what has worked uh, across the state. There's there's districts that have been back. Uh, I think some of the common themes are there's been a strong collaborative relationship with teachers and with paraprofessionals in those districts <clears throat> that have been more successful. Uh, that relationship of trust is critical. Involving county public health early in that discussion, and maybe Heath can talk about Eagle County, which I think has been a fairly successful experience. Um, Amy can talk about some of the things that she's seen where districts have reached out and really work closely with teachers. So, you know, first of all, to, that, that's going to be mostly in the future. Today, there were a few anecdotes shared, but I think collectively as a group, there was a directive to kind of look at some of the things that work in Colorado and, and report back to the group in the coming weeks. Yeah, I think one thing that um, I heard on the call today and one thing I, I feel like I can talk to in terms of our experience here in Eagle County is having um, some of that risk reduction um, toolkit, um, that guidance that was available for schools, um, for teachers, for families um, in advance of starting in person um, modality this year was really, really helpful. It helped create a level of expectation for everybody involved because realistically it's a collaborative and a shared effort. Um, and so I think that's the other lesson at least I took away very clearly from today is um, you know, where, where the effort and the vision is shared um, within a community, um, we see a lot of that success, right? So not only in terms of making sure this is a high priority for all of us in the community, and here's what we want to contribute to it to help protect that high priority in our community, but it's also making sure that you have enough resources that can respond to the needs as things do emerge. We're in a pandemic after all, so let's face it, there's gonna be cases, there's gonna be times that we have to do an investigation or we have to do contact tracing. But again, those communities that seem to share that resource and that responsibility seem to be responding very favorably right now. Sure, and I'll just add that um, I think one of the things that we know has worked well is that um, that partnership with our local health departments when they are working um, hand in hand with the local school district and providing that input and guidance. Um, so we hope that sticks around. Um, you know, I don't think I think our school leaders will share that they have never worked more closely with their uh, local health departments, and that is a, a positive thing. So that is something that. Um, we would obviously want to continue going forward. And then I would also add, um, as the governor pointed out, I think we have seen in those places where there is true collaboration between the district, the educators, the parents, um, and the local health department, there's good communication. That is where we see things um, you know, going really well. And so we need to encourage and incentivize that, uh, that type of collaboration and communication to happen um, a, as we go forward. So that's a, again, a lesson learned, I think in the places where um, sometimes that broke down or there wasn't clear or consistent uh, communication is where we saw things not going well. So that's a lesson learned about moving forward to how to do that better. Members, uh, and I want Coloradans to know uh, as we prepare to uh, celebrate Thanksgiving safely and uh, make the sacrifices that many of us are making and limiting our social interactions, wearing a mask in public and, and, and doing what we need to contain the virus. While that is all occurring, we have a very smart, talented, diverse group of people representing many stakeholders in education that are working hard, meeting several times a week in different subgroups to help increase the likelihood of uninterrupted return to in-person education across the state uh, next semester. So uh, we're working hard at this. Uh, we need, of course, the support of community members, parents, teachers, schools, districts, and others to really help make sure that we have the right resources in the right place, the right protocols in the right place at the right time to keep students and teachers safe and make sure that our kids' future uh, is not yet another casualty of this awful pandemic. Thank you all for joining us. Have a safe and happy Thanksgiving.